Hello and welcome to the March event of Astronomy on Tap, Jena. Uh, today with us we have uh, Dr. Joe Callingham from Leiden University. Hello, Joe. Hello, <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, we are very excited that you are here with us today and we will talk about many exciting things that uh, I think our viewers have not heard about some of these things before. So we have new topics for you, new exciting topics. Um, it would be great to do this event in the pub. I know Leiden has a fantastic astronomy on tap event. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's but, one going on maybe, tonight in person. Oh, oh <laughs> maybe sometime in the future. Yeah, maybe yeah. we can invite you over in Vienna and uh, you can give a talk here I'd love that. in a very nice city. It's yeah. a very, very, very student town, you know, yeah. not at the size of Leiden, but mm -hmm. very, very nice. A lot, uh, very vibrant with a lot of people around. Um, thanks for taking the time. And I would like to ask you. Well, let's start from the beginning, okay? So uh, tell us where you're from and what you ins what inspired you to go down the road of astrophysics. Okay. Um, yeah, so you might be able to tell from my accent. So I'm originally from Australia. So I was born and raised in a kind of coastal town, uh, idyllic childhood, uh, a place called Sandy Beach, very original name for it. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then um, yeah, so I moved to Sydney when I was 15 and I did my undergraduate and my PhD at the University of Sydney. Um, there I worked with uh, Professor Brian Gainsler and Professor Ron Eakers working on uh, some of the low frequency uh, observations of the sky, which we'll touch on later. Um, to touch on your second point, you know, why did I become an astronomer? That's a really hard question question for me to answer there was never a single moment where it was like ah you know some astronomers have this from like the age of four right like i want to be an astronomer i knew from day dot you know um i liked a lot of things i loved history i loved science in general i loved physics really um was my main passion um and i always had something for space right there was always this thing where i really enjoyed it i remember asking for my 11th birthday to get like this big space book and i i, I it was one of my favorite presents i ever got in my when i was a kid um, what happened? Why, why did I choose astrophysics? I, I, I always liked space, but I love physics. And when I went to uni, I did some research projects with some astrophysicists and I thought this is just awesome. And I'm incredibly privileged to be an astronomer. I feel like I'm doing my hobby for my job, you know? So I'm incredibly lucky. Obviously there's always complexities with jobs. All jobs have bad parts and good parts, but I'm incredibly privileged to do what I do. Yeah, that's that's very nice that uh, you enjoy what you do. It's like, as you said, your hobby. And I think many astronomers feel like that, right? That yeah. uh, they do astrophysics with passion and they enjoy yeah. doing it every day. Uh, although sometimes it can be, you know, a bit not boring, but tiresome when you are yeah. doing code debugging, for example, mm -hmm. and you have to understand how your code works or... Yeah. Uh, I don't know, traveling or moving around the globe to find a new job. Yeah, uh, So that can be tiring, right? Yeah, some, uh, some more negative parts. Uh, and it depends on what life phase you're in. Some of them, as the big one is traveling all over the world. You know, I'm an Australian living in the Netherlands. I'm about to marry a, a Dutch Canadian, right? Well, I met here. And who knows? I could be in the Netherlands for the rest of my life. Who knows, right? But like for so, a lot of people, that's, uh, that's difficult. Like my family back at home missed me a lot, right? And so these compromises, you know, about job, relationships, you become very, astronomy is very international and it comes with positives and negatives, right? We have friends all over the world, right? But yes, sometimes they aren't right in your backyard when you need them. So these kind of compromises uh, exist. Yeah, it's very nice to have people everywhere and know many people. You, you have to, do you say, be a bit tough when it comes uh, to leaving your loved ones behind. But yeah. The good thing is that we have internet now, so we yes. can talk to them. At yeah, least. compared so compared this... to the rest of the time in the world, right? Like we're not we're not writing a, a letter a week. You know, you can call your mum every day if you want. You know. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. So, when did you come to uh, to Europe, to the Netherlands? So it's five years ago now. So I've been in the Netherlands five years, which is a, a long time. Um, I don't know if my Australian accent's gotten weaker. Some people say it has, some haven't. Um, oh, no. <laughs> um, I've been trying, maybe maybe I have to speak slightly slower and stuff like that, and maybe I get slightly different inflections because of it. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's five years and I love it. Like, I really took it serious. I finished my PhD when I was 26, and mm -hmm. I said I was excited. I got my position at Astron, the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy. It's kind of um, 
the closest equivalent would be like Bonn, uh, like the observatory near Bonn, the radio observatory with uh, Effelsberg and stuff like that for listeners that might be familiar with the, the astronomy scene in Germany. And um, yeah, I just thought it was an adventure. Like an Australian living in Europe is fantastic, right? Like <laughs> I can hire a car, I can be in France in a day, you know, or Germany within six hours. And that's really exciting to an Australian. I think a lot of Europeans take it for granted. It's like, well, you know, of course I can go to France tomorrow, but why would I, you know? But as an Australian, yeah. I really tried to, pre-pandemic, <laughs> I really tried to take advantage of that. Well, that's nice. Uh, also, the distances here are much smaller, right? Yes. Than in yeah, Australia. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. It's, 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 it's funny. Fun. That's funny how, uh, like, I'll say, oh, I'm just going to go for a drive for eight hours. They're like, oh, such a long drive. It's like, well, <laughs> in Australia, eight hours is standard. You know, that's a short drive to go on holiday. <laughs> I can understand. I've never been, but uh, maybe when all this pandemic is over, I will yep. have the opportunity. Yeah, always uh, welcome. Happy to give uh, <laughs> recommendations as well. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but let's go back to you and what you studied and what you what your expertise is. yeah yeah sure yeah. so um as i mentioned i did my uh phd at the university of sydney and i did it with some black belt radio astronomers so mm-hmm. light exists in at many different frequencies so your listeners have probably heard of x-rays and uh radio waves and infrared you know all this kind of stuff is just light astronomers use the word light and it just captures all this uh this broad spectrum the electromagnetic spectrum And I specialize in observing the night sky at radio waves. And so my PhD, I spent a lot of time on a telescope called the Murchison Widefield Array. So this is a telescope based in the middle of nowhere, Western Australia. Just like uh, optical telescopes, you want to build these away from people because people make interference. They make light. (laughs) It's not light as in like street lights when it gets to radio waves. It's people's mobile phones or microwaves, you know, that are are causing grief. Um, And so I specialized in studying galaxies and trying to understand how they change and evolve in my PhD um, at really low frequencies. So like the frequencies you, uh, when you get in a car and you turn on the radio, that's the uh, frequencies I'm looking at the night sky with. And you see different things uh, at those frequencies than you would with your eyes. Um, And which ironically we will touch on, I guess, a little bit in terms of like what are radio stars and radio galaxies and stuff like that. Yeah, so I did my PhD there in, in that in that area, and I loved it. And yeah, and then I moved to the Netherlands to start at Astron, the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy, and uh, been playing around with all types of stuff radio. So anything I can do with a radio telescope, I try to get my hands dirty with. Ah, okay, good. So you have a very wide range of uh, expertise, as I understand. Everything that is exciting, you want to take your the data yes. and analyze it. Yeah. Yes. Positives and negatives, right? Jack of all trade, master of none, maybe, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> but that sounds exciting. So there must be a lot of similarities and also differences between these things. Uh, okay, you mentioned radio stars and radio yep. galaxies. I have a bunch of questions about these things because maybe our viewers don't really know yep. what we call a radio star. I mean, we know mm-hmm. stars, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but okay, let's start from here. What is a radio star then? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So it's not that special. It's really pretty much what you imagine. It's a star that's bright in the radio. Like that's it, right? But not every star, as we understand it, is very bright in the radio. So the sun um, emits radio waves, usually associated with really energetic phenomena. You know, uh, so if there's a big, what's called a coronal mass ejection, these are when on the outside of the, in the corona of the star, the super hot part just on the outside of the sun you can sometimes get what are called uh, magnetic reconnection events. It's a complicated word, but essentially what happens is magnetic fields snap and this really hot plasma goes spewing into space. It flies out into space and it's called a coronal mass ejection because it's in the corona. There's a bunch of mass, mass sorry, and it's ejected, right? And um, so that's really bright in the radio. And we discovered that um, there was Australians and British, mostly in the war during World War II. There was a lot of uh, observations of the sun going on. Uh, because of radar uh, and monitoring. And that was the first discovery of the sun being radio bright. But if I put the sun at, say, 10 light years away, it's just too faint. Even with the best instruments, we won't see it in the radio waves. Those emissions are very, very faint. So the type of radio stars we see today when we point with LOFAR aren't like our sun. They're a little bit different um, and they come in different flavors. And so one of them, which we'll talk about more today, are what are called M-dwarfs. These are much less massive uh, versions of the sun, say 10% of the mass of the sun. They're sometimes called 
red dwarfs because when you reduce the mass of the star you actually cool it as well so the sun is white you know so i know it looks a little yellow but that's because of atmospheric uh, distortions but the sun mm -hmm. is naturally white largely white and whitish yellow if you want to be technical <laughs> uh, and then uh, with these stars that are less massive obviously they're cooler and so they become red and sometimes they're called red dwarfs m dwarf mm -hmm. is just a, a jargon term that astronomers use oh, um, okay but uh, they are much more magnetically active. So they have really complex magnetic fields and say so they can be much brighter in the radio. Um, that's our understanding at least. Um, okay, you mentioned LOFAR. I picked up on, on this uh, keyword, let's say. So LOFAR yeah. is a radio telescope, right? Cool. And uh, what is a radio telescope? Like, yeah. Tell us so, how we observe these objects. What is a radio telescope? What LOFAR is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I like describing these at low frequencies, so like at FM frequencies, you know, the radio in your car, really the, these really sophisticated multi-million dollar instruments are essentially fancy coat hangers, you know, like that is fancy <laughs> metal coat hangers sticking in a field, you know, um, and so that's all more or less it is. And so what we're trying to do is interpret light at a frequency our eyes don't work at. So we have to use a different instrument, right? So your, your uh, viewers probably have an idea of a telescope in their brain and often they probably think of these big like uh, mirrors, you know, that's kind of a state of art in optical land, you know, because that's also how you exploit focusing light. You can use big mirrors, but you can't do that at radio frequencies. Radio uh, just passes right through a mirror. That's why you can get reception on your mobile phone when you're sitting at home, right? The radio wave goes right through the brick wall. So mm -hmm. mirror does nothing to it. So you need to interact with the wave in a different way. And one way is just through metal. Uh, you couple it through a big chunk of metal. Just like um, in old cars. I don't know how, like, the age of your, list, your, age of your viewers, but anyone over the age of 30 will remember antennas on cars, you know, like those things that used to stick up, you know. And that, that's essentially the same principle we're using with these old radio cars. Products. I mean, <laughs> my car has an antenna. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm not old. I'm not old. My car is young. <laughs> So LOFAR is um, the state of the art of these low frequency instruments. Okay. And so it's based in the Netherlands where a lot of it is, but it has uh, stations throughout Europe. So there's three big stations in Germany as well that are really important for the way the telescope operates um, because of the way we, uh, we collect the light. And so those German stations tell us information on about the distance uh, between the Netherlands and Germany, which is a, a actually really important distance when it comes to oh. trying to image and understand the radio sky. Very nice. Glad to be of service. <laughs> and, I hope German uh, astronomers are also <laughs> German astronomers are also having fun with it. It's not just Dutch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and uh, I guess the more stations you have, uh, and you mo the more you spread out, the more information you can get, right? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, mm -hmm. some premise of way uh, radio telescopes work. I, I don't I don't want to go into too much depth for your listeners, but it works on the uh, principle of interferometry, and so this is a complex way of like combining data on different distances. And those different distances tell you about spatial scales in the sky. So the further the way your, your, um, your telescopes are, so the one in Germany and one in the Netherlands, uh, the more uh, fine resolution, so the more intimate detail I can make out in the radio galaxies further away. Uh, right. So how do you observe these radio stars? I don't know how? if it's too technical, but... No, I well, I, I, I like... Playing. Yeah, so maybe I'll start from an interesting premise, right? So yeah. the most radio sources in the sky, if I could turn your eyes into, say, 40 megahertz receivers, right? Made them into big radio antenna, you know, those big satellite mm -hmm. dishes. And I ask you to look up in the night sky. To your eye, what you'd see is a whole bunch of dots. But all those dots are more or less galaxies. They're actually really far away material falling into a black hole and they're spewing out jets and they're really radio bright. That's like 99% of all, all stuff with your radio eyes, unlike your eyes, right? When I tell you to look at the night sky with your eyes, you see stars, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're just burning hydrogen to helium in their core and being really bright and optical. So what I've been trying to do is find these types of radio stars. And as I said, it's kind of a needles in a haystack experiment, right? As I said, all of them are extragalactic. So how do I go about finding these things? So one way you could do it is you go, well, Joe, all the optical, optical astronomers, you know, they all went and said, there's a star here and there's a star there and a star there. Why don't you just take that and go and look at your radio image? The difficulty there is there's so many stars. As soon as I do that, I just have like chance matches. What are they called? Chance or false positives. 
So you can have this situation where a, uh, a star, yeah, it's well known, it's right there, but because the radio um, position is so poor, like we don't get as high resolution, um, the chance situation of galaxies just right behind it is very high. And what what is it, a false positive? Uh, like it's not a true association, right? You just had a chance alignment of a star and a galaxy in the radio. So how do we get around this problem? How can we find radio stars reliably, right? So we can go with 100% certainty, that source is that star. There's a trick. And that trick has to do with polarization. Right, with polarization. <laughs> yeah. So polarization is got to do with the way light propagates. So light has a direction. And then this is the kind of how your uh, sunglasses work. You, everyone's probably heard of polarized sunglasses. Mm -hmm. And so the idea here is that when light reflects off uh, surfaces like the so if you're going fishing or you're going on a nice day on the lake, you know, you want to wear polarized glasses because what happens when the light reflects, it gets a preferential, a desired direction, which then you can filter out and you can make stop with the glasses. This is kind of similar to how um, on the microwave, you might notice a grid on the front. That's also how a microwave, you can see through to look and no radiation escapes. It's because this polarized grid, grid stops all light getting out because light uh, if you go into the mathematics, I don't want to bore all the readers, has, has a, is a vector. So it has a preferential direction it wants to travel. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so the details here is that the special thing with radio stars is when they do those big explosions, those coronal mass ejections, is that type of emission is very highly circularly polarized. So it looks like the light wants to do this when it emits. And it's got to do with the way um, the radio waves are being produced. Electrons move in a the electrons producing the radio waves move in a really uh, cohesive sense. They move like a population. They move together. And that makes this lovely spiral pattern. And that's how we find them. We look for this spiral uh, circular uh, signature in the sky. Okay. I hope that was uh, not too in-depth. <laughs> uh, I think it's okay. But uh, as we said, you can answer the questions live <laughs> uh, to our viewers. Uh, so if they have questions, they can. <laughs> I have an intruder here. Yeah. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hello. <laughs> Say hello. Good. hello. This is my interference. Oh. <laughs> it's not in the radio. <laughs> it's in the optical. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you cannot use polarization <laughs> to block it out. <laughs> no. I have a portal. A portal. <laughs> yeah, go play for me. Bye. 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 <laughs> Do you play Fortnite, Joe? <laughs> I've never played Fortnite. I'm just a bit too old, I think. But okay. it looks fun. <laughs> it's ne you're never too old to play. Uh, I think I just need to be introduced, but introduced to it by someone younger. <laughs> yes, it's it's what the uh, the kids do these days. <laughs> I'm young enough. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. So since we had this little uh, break, uh, yeah. I, oh yes, it's time for our game all let's, right let's play, let's play the game now before i ask more questions about sure. these stars and what help us uh, find and your discoveries and everything yeah. so uh, we will do the true or false in two rounds let's start okay all right. so i will say a sentence and then you can you will say true or false okay. and maybe explain a bit us to us why uh okay so the first one Proxima Centauri, the closest star to the sun, is a red dwarf. True. It's true. Okay. <laughs> good, good. I, I, I'm waiting for you to catch me out on something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think you know everything, really. Okay, let me let me read the second one. M dwarf is what the star is called after it explodes as supernova. Unfortunately, false that one. Oh no! <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, so an M dwarf is just like our sun. Oh, sorry, my dog's. Uh, uh, M dwarf is just like our sun, um, uh, just much less massive. So it's doing hydrogen to helium in its core. Uh, a supernova is when a more massive star, like ten times the mass of our sun, uh, runs out of hydrogen and uh, and other periodic table helium, iron, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And explodes because it run gravity wins eventually. Um, gravity <laughs> always wins in in astronomy. It's a good good thing to remember. Yes, yes, great. So two out of two, you're on a roll. Okay, so the next one. 
Uh, 50 of the 60 nearest stars to the Earth are red dwarfs. True or false? That's true. Um, oh, oh, my God, sure. you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the reason for this is because it's much easier to form smaller stars and big stars. So when, mm -hmm. when a star forms, it's formed out of a big cloud of gas and stuff. And so mm -hmm. it's just like anything, right? If you have uh, a whole bunch of like, uh, you don't have much gas, you know, it's easy to form an M-dwarf, but you can't form something like the sun. Or you can't form something like as massive as say, what's called an O-type star, these big blue bright stars that burn really aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So 80% of all stars out there are M-dwarfs. They're just much harder to see by eye. Mm -hmm. excuse me from the beer uh because of uh uh because they're much less massive they put out less light um mm -hmm. uh because that, that really ties it together the uh mass and luminosity how bright something is sorry my interference is singing <laughs> but he's very happy apparently good thanks and maybe you just answered my second question also my other question the next one my four, fifth no, no, the fourth question first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these 50 red dwarfs are visible with, with a naked eye. False. <laughs> 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 I did answer it largely. And as I said, much less massive. They may be nearby, but they're hiding in plain sight. You need big telescopes mm -hmm. to find them. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why it took so long. You know, big things like Betelgeuse or Sirius, mm -hmm. you know, these famous mm -hmm. stars, you know, mm -hmm. They're massive, you know, and these mm. M-dwarfs are like puny little ants compared to these stars. Ah, oh, good to have the comparison in our heads. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And these dwarfs make up 50% of the skies in the Milky Way. I have to say false because it's about 80%, but I don't know, like 50% I'll take, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, you're right. I, I think yeah. if I had to guess, it's 80%. Uh, uh, okay, my my sources say yeah. it's around three quarters. <laughs> that's so, about, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but you know, like, uh, you know, order of magnitude. Yeah, yeah, we're <laughs> astronomers, right? It's not 7%, we all agree on that. 70% <laughs> is about right. 70 to 80% is totally reasonable. Yeah. So amazing. Uh, okay, I have one more, two more. Okay, yeah. let's let's do all of them and then we'll go back uh, okay. to our discussion. No worries. Uh, no worries. Red dwarfs often exhibit flares, which makes them twice as bright. This variability of the star is very good for the creation of life in the planets which orbit them. Yeah, so the first one, Definitely true. These stars, as I said, are very magnetically active. So they flare, they put out junk all the time. Uh, they're spewing plasma into space all the time. So definitely true. The next one is highly contentious. That's where a lot of research is going on right now. It's like, okay. could these flares, are they bad for the planet? And it's like, well, clearly you don't want to bombard a planet continually with, with hot plasma, right? Million degree plasma onto the planet. But the other idea here is compromise is that maybe you need that type of activity to stimulate the first cell cellular growth, you know, that first mm -hmm. transition. You need the radiation to kind of encourage it. So it's a very complex uh, discussion. This ah. broad idea of what makes a planet habitable is mm -hmm. very complex. Um, a lot of your listeners have probably heard of the Goldilocks zone, right? And that's what we yeah. thought 20 years ago. It was like, well, you know, the, hot, the planet's not too hot, not too cold. It can have liquid water on the surface, you know? But now we understand there's a lot more parts to that problem than just uh, liquid water on the surface, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that's what we're uh, working I on. didn't know it was so complex. Uh, okay, my sources had it more as a black and white, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, answer question thing. But yeah, that's very interesting. Um, let me check the other one, if it goes with, this discussion. Um, okay, they, okay. Right, I will, I will make the question and then you will explain to us all about the planets around the stars and sure. your fantastic discovery. Yeah. So yeah. the motions of the planets of uh, our solar system uh, through the sun's magnetic field act like an electric engine which generate a huge current that powers aurora and radio emission on the sun. Yeah. So this is about the sun. Oh, yeah. You want me to further explain this or? No, no, to see if it's false. Or oh, true. okay. On the sun. 
Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. sorry, it was the true or false one. Um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, the last one. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't drive it on our sun. No, we don't get any aurora directly from our sun, but we have Jupiter, who's uh, we can see uh, this type of emission. And some of the ideas that my colleagues and I have had is that maybe, um, as I'll explain in a second, instead of having Jupiter and its nearest moon Io driving these beautiful aurora in the radio, um, you could have the star and a planet instead. Ah, that's very interesting. So a little bit of a teaser for the next like minute. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. It is. So actually, this discovery is amazing because it's something that we haven't, we are not used to, right? We're not. Yeah. We know exoplanets. We have been hearing about exoplanets for a long time now. We have telescopes that discover thousands of them, and we have also candidate candidate exoplanets in in the region around our solar system. But uh, with the radio, it's mm. something new. So yes, that's my question. Can you detect exoplanets using radio and LOFAR? Well, that's the hope. And that's what we're trying to show. And that's what we're trying to prove. So the idea here for your listeners is that exoplanets been known for about 25 years now, and they're all discovered in the optical. So that means you look at a, a couple of different ways. One way is very standard. You keep staring at the star and you wait for maybe a planet to go across it, to transit it. And what that does is block a little bit of light. So if you're just counting the light from a star, you know, it's constantly at like, let's say 100, 100 watts, right? Obviously it's a lot brighter, but 100 watts, 100 watts. And then you look and it's actually 99.9 watts, only for a little while. And then it goes back to 100 watts. There's a planet, you know? And so that's one of the discovery methods. Mm-hmm. The other one uses the Doppler shift. So what happens is when a planet's massive enough, near enough a star, it actually affects the gravity of the star. It can drag the star back and forth. And when you look at Earth, what happens is the light from that star then gets red and blue shifted. Uh, this is called the Doppler effect. And, and you, you're, all your listeners are familiar with it because of like ambulances. You know, if you're listening to an ambulance and it's coming towards you, it sounds higher pitch. And when it goes past you, it's lower pitch and uh similar stuff even motorcycles or scooters you can hear it you know it's like higher pitch then lower pitch um uh so that's another way you can discover it because the the star wobbles it gets pulled back and forth by the planet Mm -hmm. now in the radio we have to do something different because Mm -hmm. one we can't as i said to you before we don't really see stars you know so they're faint so you can't use a transit method or the uh, the radial velocity method because that requires optical light so what could you do and what we had had was an idea that when you look at the solar system, you go, what are the brightest things in the radio? So the sun's really bright, but ironically, about the only time this happens in all the electromagnetic spectrum, you know? So if I ask you, what's the brightest object in ultraviolet light? What's the brightest object in the sky at infrared, x-rays, gamma rays? It's always the sun, right? Because the sun's so bright. But the only time that's not true is at 40 megahertz, at low radio frequencies. Mm-hmm. And there, Jupiter becomes the brightest thing, which is funny, you know. I mean, it's also a funny science fiction idea to think if you evolve with like antennas, you know, <laughs> would you value Jupiter more than the sun and all this kind of fun, interesting <laughs> stuff you can do. Um, but Jupiter uh, is really bright. And the reason for this is because of its nearest moon called Io. So mm-hmm. Io is a conductor. It's uh, very volcanically active. It's got these big volcanoes that are spewing out uh, lava and ionizing its environment. So it's just essentially making lots of charges in, in the environment. And Jupiter has this big, strong magnetic field. And what happens is as Jupiter's magnetic field sweeps over it, that drives uh, a, a current, a circuit, which makes these beautiful radio aurora, which you've got in the background of your, your uh, image, uh, and also I, the aurora on Earth that I have here. Now, the aurora on Earth is a little bit different. It's got to do with solar radiation, but Jupiter Io makes everything so much brighter. It's, um, it's an electrodynamic engine. So it's just like um, maybe some of your listeners, particularly in Germany, are used to riding bikes all the time. Mm-hmm. And those si- the bicycles, um, you might remember some of the old ones, you could push down a dynamo to turn yeah. the light. You push it on the wheel and it would turn and then the light would turn with the wheel. It's, it's, it's the same principle, right? So what's happening is you're turn, a magnetic field sweeping over conductor because that's kind of what the uh, dynamo has got in it. It's got rotating uh, coils and a magnetic field. And that drives really bright radio emission and makes it look like a light, a turn on a light. And that's really circularly polarized, which I mentioned before. So the idea we had is like, well, 
could we find uh, a Jupiter system? Again, the problem is if I put Jupiter at like 10 light years, it's just not bright enough. So how can we make it brighter? And the idea we had was, well, let's, let's boost it up. Let's try and like take it to the max, the physics to the max, you know? And one way we could do this is replace Jupiter with a star and Io, the moon, with an exoplanet. And then mm -hmm. maybe we could make it bright enough. And that's what we did. Okay. Wow. Scale it up. Yeah. Super size it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Super size it with your part. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so we were, we're lucky that we found something, in all honesty, because uh, it was a pretty harebrained idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, when I've heard of it, uh, when I read of it, I, and it's a nature paper, right? It's a discovery, this one. And there, it has been, I think there was a follow-up with this to yeah. verify the, yes. the system. Yeah. And it was a, they yeah. verified, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's true. <laughs> we well, well, I don't know. It's true. But there's a couple of things we need to do to make it a, like to dot what I would call dot our I's and cross our T's. At the moment, I would say we're uh, very confident. But okay. to really like when you make a new discovery in astronomy, you really have to convince everyone, right? You really have to be mm -hmm. super thorough. And we're at that, we're at one last step, which I'll explain later, that will be like once we get that there can be no other explanation, right? Because anyone can go, well, you just found a weird star and we don't understand how stars work. You know, it's a get out, like, it's not a very strong intellectual argument because we go, hey, here's a model that all fits the data. Um, mm -hmm. But to like, there is one, one part of uh, the emission we expect, which I'll explain in a bit, um, mm -hmm. that can only be driven if a, a planet exists and is driving the emission. Um, okay. uh, so, but yeah. We'll get to it. I, I have a lot of questions regarding planets and their stars now. <laughs> uh, so can we use LOFAR to find uh, planets like the Earth? So because the Earth, I mean, yeah. this is the big question, right? Yeah. Are there what, more uh, Earths yeah. out there? Yeah, it is a big question. And the question is, what kind of Earth are you talking about? So if you're talking about Earth around a G-dwarf sun, so like our, our sun, like, a G, like what's called a G-dwarf for technical reasons, just like the red, red dwarfs are called M-dwarfs, the, mm -hmm. if, if you're talking about an Earth around a sun like ours, unlikely um, with low far, you need to go to the next generation because our Rory, so that beautiful thing we see behind our, my back, um, isn't driven by the moon, right? The moon's too far away. What it's driven by is solar radiation falling onto Earth. So you, anyone that's gone chasing the Aurora Borealis or the Aurora Australis knows what you want is one, clear nights. That's really important, <laughs> obviously. You don't want clouds. But number two, you want really active solar, solar activity because you want that plasma, the solar wind, impacting what's called the magnetosphere, the magnetic field of the Earth and driving really bright radio aurora. Because you can have a clear night. If the sun's not very active, you'll never see this aurora. Mm -hmm. um, and so with Earth, that's where the emission comes from, unlike Jupiter Io. Um, so we need to um, hunt that and that's much fainter. So you need what's called the next generation instrument, which is like the square kilometer array. And that, that might be able to do it. Um, we'll see. The other option, if we really want to take the logical extreme of this is to put a telescope on the dark side of the moon because then mm -hmm. you can really work at low frequencies um, and, and pick it up there. Is there a plan to do that? Well, there's a lot of suggestions. Um, okay. Building a telescope on the moon is not a simple process, as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're trying our best. I think uh, largely, well, the Europeans don't have any plans, but there's some movement in America and possibly China. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, good. Well, let's see. The future <laughs> has many possibilities, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Right. What's my next question? It's about the magnetic field of the star. Did we discuss this already? I think you, you mentioned it a bit. If uh, it I have been talking if a the lot. planet will be <laughs> habitable or not. Sorry? No, I have been talking a lot, so it's possible I covered it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Okay, then let's have a, a sip of beer because yeah, I know yeah. you like beer. So, yep. clink. <laughs> Virtual clink. Yeah, virtual cling. And um, yeah, so my question was, uh, how does the star's magnetic field influence if, le if a planet will be habitable or not? Yeah, so a star's magnetic field is a little more complex there. Mm -hmm. So we think our, like, you can imagine in this context, the magnetic fields around all these planets are like shields, 
right? Mm. So what you have is a lot of radiation in space. And that radiation is not useful for life usually. You, know? you don't want to be bombarded by high energy radiation any more than you have to. And so, for example, the sun's magnetic field protects us from a lot of it really aggressive galactic emission, you know, high energy emission that would potentially just impact Earth. So a sun's magnetic field probably plays a role in that regard. The more important one is the planet's magnetic field because that shield is from the star's activity. <laughs> so the star, as I said, spews out plasma all the time, is hyper aggressive with uh, its environment. And mm -hmm. uh, what we want on Earth is to say, have a nice atmosphere that's retained, right? So we can breathe. That's really important. And so our Earth's magnetic field acts as a shield in that environment. That's why you have this aurora, right? Because the aurora, what happens is the, this aggressive emission gets hits the Earth's magnetic field and gets pulled to the poles mm -hmm. instead of just hitting Earth and stripping it. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, an analogy in our solar system where this isn't the case, and that's Mars. Mars mm -hmm. doesn't have a magnetic field. Yeah. And what, we, what happened there was because it doesn't have a magnetic field, over millions of years, that solar radiation just stripped it. It's kind of like a sandcastle next to ocean, you know? Sometimes one wave won't do it, but you leave it long enough, eventually it just get the, the sun castle just disappears over time. And it's the same thing uh, with Mars. So it's lost a lot of its atmosphere in the face of solar radiation because it doesn't have a magnetic field. So we think having a magnetic field is important to having life. Mm -hmm. uh, so if in this paradigm, for example, that I have, okay, behind me, right? Where you have... Yeah the star or a satellite of uh, a star yep. and the satellite of a star uh, if both have a magnetic field you would see aurora in both both yeah but from the same type yeah that's it, it's complex uh, so at the moment we think we're seeing aurora on the star because the mm -hmm. trick is when you see aurora that emission the type of emission is very dependent on um it's very, very dependent on uh, the magnetic field strength, how strong the magnetic field is, where it happens in frequency. So Earth is not very strong. So you need to go to very, very low frequency. You need to go below your FM radio, right? You turn on your FM, you need to go like, your FM radio will go to 700, uh, 70 megahertz. You need to go down to like 10, uh, one megahertz, you know, to start seeing the Earth's uh, magnetic field, uh, the Rory in the radio. But the sun, or a star has a much stronger magnetic field, so that can boost it into the uh, FM frequency band that low far and the instruments we have today can see because mm -hmm. um, you can't see those really low frequencies from the Earth because this stuff gets in the way, the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. So that's why I discussed early, uh, before about um, the uh, telescope on the back side of the moon, yeah. the dark side of the moon. Great. Uh, good. That answers my question. Okay, so now we have talked a lot about stars and exoplanets. You also said that you uh, worked a bit on galaxy evolution and radio galaxies and stuff. Yeah. So for you, what is the most important? In By the way, sorry, we're having another yeah. interrupter. I got a little puppy. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry, oh my God, so cute. <laughs> Say hello, Halifax. Aren't you the cutest? Hello to Germany. <laughs> hello. <laughs> He's like, hello. I've had enough of this now. <laughs> we will be done soon. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's starting to get hungry. Anyway, sorry. He was uh, he was trying to grab my attention. Not a problem. I mean, mm. you, you can see. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I thought Not maybe, you, maybe your viewers would be interested in seeing a puppy for a second. <laughs> I think the viewers really love uh, also kids. And yep. animals, All so, right. yeah, they would appreciate that. We also <laughs> had cats before appearing. <laughs> All right, the <laughs> there's no problem, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can have a, a full range of pets, maybe yes, bear exactly. or yeah, something birds, exotic. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, so uh, you said you enjoy studying different things about our yeah. universe. So yeah. what is the most important in understanding the universe oh. and how do these things interlink in your view? It's a good question. I firmly believe I just want to have fun with my job. Mm -hmm. And that means just chasing things I think are fun. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't say I've, I've got any more thought process to it. You know, it's just like, do I enjoy this? Obviously, when your colleagues find what you're doing interesting, you get a feedback loop. So for example, 
like uh, the exoplanet stuff is really interesting to all my optical colleagues, you know, while radio galaxies sometimes aren't as much, you know, and stuff like that. And so like, then you have a feedback loop, you know, and you're like, oh, well, I'll keep going on this star exoplanet thing if I want. But really, um, science is a bit like art. There's no true good thing, right? There's no like science that's better than another. You know, you just learn something different about the universe. Um, it's usually humans that assign value to that, right? And I wouldn't say that's always a good thing. Usually we're quite poor at assigning value, you know, like Euler's formula when that was first discovered wasn't assigned a ton of value, you know, but uh, lo and behold, it's very important. How do we understand how the universe works? And uh, mm -hmm. it's very important mathematical identity for your, uh, for your viewers that might know it. What I'm just trying to say is um, I just try to have fun. And uh, that means I move around because I guess that's part of my personality. Maybe I get bored after a while um <laughs> in one topic uh i've only yeah anyway i'm i'm a bit different some astronomers focus highly specialized yeah. i'm i'm not like that uh but i think it's very interesting to do different things because you gain a, a lot of knowledge also and maybe a broader understanding of the universe yeah. and not just looking at one field with mm -hmm. one instrument, something yeah. that yeah. Uh, astronomers used to do way in the past, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. They were specialized, uh, I don't know, in X-ray astronomy, they would only mm -hmm. do that, yeah. X-ray yeah. astronomy, active galaxies, that's it. But now you see everyone is trying to do a bit of multi-wavelength or mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. a broader uh, expertise not only yeah. to one specific field no i think so i think a lot of growth comes from what's called cross fertilization of ideas right some fields have really good ideas for some reason don't reach another field and if you have exposure to a lot of them you can kind of do that you can bring us like hang on that was a great idea in uh in stellar astronomy how to understand stars and now i can apply it to galaxies you know mm -hmm. and you kind of learn something i know maybe to your listeners that sounds like well geez astronomers what are you guys doing you know but like people become hyper-specialized. That's what a PhD is, right? And sometimes you can lose for the forest to the trees, you know, like you don't see the broader picture. Um, and so my supervisor, Ron Eek, is had a saying is like, don't follow the thunderous herd, you know, try and do something different, a bit like out there, have fun mm -hmm. while you're doing it. And I really took that seriously. That's good. And it worked. Look at this nice picture we have. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it goes very, I, I like it. I will keep it. <laughs> uh, good, I'm glad. Very nice background. Uh, okay, so since we talked about astronomers and the research and uh, the universe, what do you think will be the next big discovery? Then? The biggest discovery. Oh, man. That's the a next really one. The tough next one. one. Yeah, the next one, even, you know, obviously I have my own desires. Like, I think we're working really hard and maybe radio astronomy will play a part of this is finding another earth-like planet and when i mean earth-like planet i mean about the mass of earth we know it's, it has an atmosphere and it's around a star like our sun right that's yeah. that would be amazing to discover but i think the fun thing about astronomy is the stuff that you don't always necessarily expect that changes the way we think about the world you know like um the event horizon telescope result of that black hole was phenomenal and i that wasn't really on my radar until a couple of years ago and i'm an astronomer right um and the next big big discovery oh, yeah i think extraterrestrial life is always a big one but like when that would happen or how you make that happen is like that, that feeds into the at least the at least the earth one you know finding another earth-like planet we can methodically put down the steps how to do it when it comes mm -hmm. to like finding like aliens or extraterrestrial life it's just like how are you going to do this you know what is extraterrestrial life what does it look like you know how can you find this stuff um that would change human human humanity forever you know if we make that discovery not it's not just like a, a revolution in astronomy um yeah. so i don't know i think the other big field at the moment that i'm really interested in is um gravitational waves are interesting for your listeners you know colliding black holes and that's really mm -hmm. interesting in terms of probes of fundamental physics but the other big one is what's called fast radio bursts in the radio we see all these types of really bright bursts and the question is what are they and where are they coming from that's also super engaging so i i copped out i gave like 10 different answers to your question um <laughs> everything <laughs> everything's interesting maybe that's why i work on so many things <laughs> so, so now we know the your list to do is yeah. your project yeah, yeah. find et number one no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why not? Why There's not? some astronomers doing that. I, yeah, I'm yeah not there are astronomers them, so. doing that seriously, yeah. not just yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The SETI program is like actively exactly. for yeah. uh, yeah. science of like satellite. Very, uh, very tough job. Very tough yeah. job. Yeah. yeah. Also using radio data because yeah. they want to detect uh, frequencies that we hear. Yeah. Basically, communicate right? on. Right. Yeah. Communication. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Joe, I don't want to take more of your time. It was a great pleasure having us uh, with you and learning all these amazing things about uh, the radio universe. Um, and guys, if you have questions, uh, you can type them uh, on the chat or contact us uh, as astronomy on tap Vienna or contact Joe. I'm sure he's more than Very happy, happy to, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you can send through my contact details or just Google me and you'll yep. find my contact details. Very happy Twitter, to answer any Twitter. questions. Yeah, yeah. On yeah or Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, Twitter is also works. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Great. Thank you very much. And we will renew our date for April now. Sounds okay. great. And thank you very much uh, for having me. I really appreciate it. Have a good evening. Bye. All right, bye.